at Electricity Transformation Canada 23. We're here to talk ice detection with Andre Beijing Droule with Ice Tech. And Ice, welcome to the program. Thank first. you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Ice Tech is a new ice detection system that I was first introduced to by uh, Borealis Wind. Uh, that Daniela said we got this new ice detector and it's fabulous. It tells us all these great, wonderful things about ice that we never knew before. And I had never heard of it, which was odd because uh, we live in a place where there's a lot of snow and ice. I usually hear about ice detection. It's sort of the thing that happens. Uh, but IceTech is, a, is a, a relatively new company based in Quebec. Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, we started the company in 2020, so that's three years from okay. now. But uh, it's a spin-off from a, a university project. Right. Uh, we, I'm a mechanical engineering professor uh, in Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, we developed the sensor throughout the research for the last 15 years. Yeah. So we did wow. a lot of research, okay. academic research. It was a tool for us to understand icing uh, on wind turbines. And then I started a partnership with uh, Daniela, a uh, research partnership uh, with them to help them be, uh, be better. And this is where it, uh, it all started, where she, after the, the project, she asked, can we buy those sensors? They were not for sale because it was... Uh, <laughs> A research product uh, at the moment, and then yeah. this is when the university uh, sort of uh, encouraged us to uh, to go and, and start a spin-off uh, company for, for that. Because the the problem is not just knowing that there's ice. The problem is trying to know that ice is coming. That's the trick. Uh, and a lot of the ice detectors that are out there are, are really binary. That ice is here. Ice is left. Uh, but in an operational sense, in a wind turbine, it doesn't really help you all that much. At least a lot of downtime. Yeah. So ice is a very complicated uh, yes. problem. <laughs> ice ta can take different incarnation, get yep. freezing rain, blaze ice, rime ice, yeah. or frost, uh, different type under different conditions. And we, we learned that through our 15 years of research that it can take different uh, Incarnation, and uh, we, we designed the sensor so that we could know when it starts. So the really onset of icing, when there's no icing visible, but the conditions are prone for to icing. And then what's the intensity of icing? What's the the amount of liquid water content in in the atmosphere when it stops? The meteorological icing, because when the, the the meteorological icing is is over, you can still have ice on the structure. Is, yes. still, is this still icing? <laughs> yes, but it's called instrumental icing, or persistence of, of icing. So all these different phases of, of the icing, you need to understand them. And as you mentioned, it's not a, a binary number. No, 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 it definitely isn't. And I know Daniela tried to explain that to me several months ago, and it just went, I, there was a lot going on there. So I'm <laughs> glad we have time to sit down and discuss it. Okay, so let's just, Walk through what the sensor is, because it looks different than ever, any other icing sensor that I've ever seen. It's a, it's kind of a metallic cylinder. Yeah, we're using a, a term, thermodynamic approach. Okay. So we're having a heated cylinder that we know the amount of heat that we fed into that cylinder. We also know the surface temperature of that cylinder because we have those uh, temperature probe inside the, the cylinder, but close to the to the walls. Uh, and we also measure the Airspeed, the air temperature, relative humidity, uh, solar radiation. And based on all these parameters, we do uh, modeling what should be the surface temperature, knowing all those those parameters. And then we compare. So it's 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 more than just detection of ice itself. You're detecting basically temperature, yep. uh, the amount of heat pulled off the the, the cylindrical sensor. You have a solar sensor. Yeah. And this is really fascinating because when I saw the sensor the first time, I wasn't sure what was the magic piece here. But it's more than just one sensor. In order to do this calculation, you need actually multiple sensors. So you have temperature, true temperature, true air temperature. Yeah. You have the sun condition, sun out, no sun. Uh, and then you have wind speed with the ultrasonic FT sensor. sensor. In the yeah, middle. which is a really nice sensor. Okay, so that's high quality stuff. But then inside of this, cylinder, this metal cylinder, there's circuitry. There's a brain inside. There's a brain inside. Uh, okay. Something that would not have been possible to do 20 years ago. 
through the democratization of electronics right. and uh, micro right. uh, microchip and everything. So we do live calculation inside the sensor okay. using all these parameters, and we uh, in inside the, the the sensor we model. So we do live modeling of the, the surface temperature of uh, of these cylinder and why you, we use cylinder because they're easy to model. Yeah, so right. We went for right. that. Journey. Right, it's a it's a basic model. It's an aerodynamic model. It's an aerodynamic, dynamic, uh, thermodynamic. Uh, model. Exactly, yeah. It's, and it's simple to do sort of CFT yeah. thermodynamic model stuff. Okay, so so now you have one, two, three, four different sensors. You have a, a, a brain inside of it, and in that brain is a bunch of software. I I assume, and, and that software is taking all those parameters and trying to figure out, okay, ice is about to come, ice is over. Uh, you, did you have to create those models yourself? Did you go to a wind tunnel to do that? How did that all get yeah, done? Since it was developed uh, through academic research. We had access to all these wind tunnels, infrastructures and everything. So okay. we, we, come, we, we come with the, with the background of 15 years of academic research right. where we did yeah. all these, these stuff. We went through uh, a cold climate uh, chamber to simulate the uh, icing. Uh, we we use all these this knowledge, this academic knowledge, to to come up with this, uh, this nice product. So where was the icing wind tunnel at? Is that it's, in Canada? Uh, it's in it's in Canada. It's in Quebec City. So it's a refrigerated wind tunnel that was built in the in the sixties. It's a closed loop wind tunnel. It goes oh, yeah? Uh, uh, yeah. over two floors, uh, and it's all wood. But we we s sort of retrofitted the. Icing uh, 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 in in there, we had to dry the tunnel after each run. But it was a very uh, unique uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, because you us. usually don't put water in these wood tunnels. No, that's a forbidden thing to do. So you had to must have twisted some arms there, convince some people to let you get their 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 fabulous wind tunnel wet. Yes, but it, we we dried it. We okay. it was built in house. We we know how to rebuild it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we had that that leverage, and that's what's fun in, in, in the mechanical engineering department. What we do things and we can place things. Sure, sure, sure. So why was that tunnel there originally? It's been there for a while. It's been there for a while. Uh, it's it was not refrigerated at the time. Yeah. So this unit was added in the early uh, or late 1990s. Uh, okay. And then they, they build on on that to, okay. to do different uh, experiments. It's, it's used for uh, for teaching as well. So, okay, making parkas and hats and all the Canadian <laughs> gear, gloves. That's how they check Canada, all that equipment. Canada goose jackets. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good promotional tool for Canada. Okay, so you have all these resources at your fingertips. You're you've created this basic instrument. You're now taking it to a wind tunnel. You're validating it. You're coming with the curves. Are you doing yeah. empirical measurements? We, we, we did a lot of empirical curve okay. in the wind tunnel. All right. But then the real test was when it was on a turbine. Because when you're, yeah. you're on a turbine, you're behind the rotor. There's a lot of, uh, there's some weight. There's Just some turbulence and density. Mess. Uh, and we, it's messy. Yeah. The, the, the wind flow is, is messy. And we redid some uh, in situ calibration or uh, yeah. uh, empirical curves uh, on site and we also added cameras there so we had a side view <laughs> of the sensor uh -huh. so we could measure the ice accumulation on on the structure and then correlate our, our model and fine-tune our model for and we have a different calibration for for each turbine type oh really yeah. okay it depends on where it is located on on the nacelle, on the nacelle yeah. uh, okay so i wanted to get into that because this relies so much on the airflow and the parameters around the airflow how sensitive is that? And if you have to, so you're taking a base model out to, let's say, a GE 3X, the magic turbine is in Canada at the moment. So you're, you're installing it on, on the turbine, on the nacelle. Uh, you have a caliber, it's already sort of calibrated yeah. itself. It's close, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. close. And then you just go through an adjustment phase to understand, uh, are you understanding the, the local environment or is it more specific to the aerodynamics? around the that nacelle and turbine itself. it's specific to the flow that will go around these heated cylinder because this right. is the right the, the piece that we're uh, investigating right. those two probes and we have two for redundancy okay so we know that ice will fall from the blades and will damage uh, and might damage yeah. the yeah. instrument 
And so well, if they don't, if they install Borealis, it won't damage it. Yeah. <laughs> That's you why go. you install Borealis, so yeah. you don't damage your icing instrument. And, and um, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of very intelligent uh, people surrounding me. Yeah. And we, with the, the instrument and with the brain that's inside the instrument, right. we're able to do automatic calibration. So we set it mm. up there and it knows, it has its own algorithm that will, day after day, fine tune the, the model. And we know when there's no icing. So this is when we, we tune the... So the, it gets better with time. It gets with better time. with I like time. Yeah. Better with time. <laughs> so it, the, the outputs from the, the system, right? Just like this, like dumb this down for someone that's a, like me, that's going to be on a, on a site. What is it going to tell me and what actions do I take from it? So the first thing is going to tell you it's the onset of icing. Yeah. So at that time, the conditions are prone for icing. Yeah. You should take some actions. And it's, it's, it's like cloud based. I'm going to get an email or I'm going to be able to check in. It's it. We are we're very flexible. Okay. So at the moment, we, we on some system we're integrated into the SCADA. We have also uh, modem uh, cellular communication that feeds the data through the cloud, and then it can text, it can email. Uh, depends on the customer. Everybody yeah. has something uh, different. With the Borealis system, we're hardwired to their system directly, and we will trigger when to start and stop the, the, the IPS. So does your system work in conjunction with some other systems that may be on the turbine already? Yeah, we, we've, we've uh, worked with the turbine operator a lot. Okay. And they work with turbine manufacturers. So right. we had an agreement to trigger other IPS system as well, just to optimize the operation of those, of those systems. So this is a, a, a direct uh, value for the customer as they're seeing the use right away of the sensor, and they're optimizing their uh, their operations using the sensor. So, so one thing I want to talk about again, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, my operator hat on, is well, off air we were talking about this a little bit. Of course, you guys are in Quebec, in Canada, almost everything is a fixed PPA price. So the, the markets are going to stay stable. Uh, but there is places in the world, say like ERCOT down in Texas, where it's an unregulated power market. So the, the power prices, that power purchasing prices in the market can go up and down and up and down. And we know that we saw what, $9,000 megawatt hour yeah. during, oh, the, yeah. during the ice storm down there. So if you had assets that were able to produce during that, you could you could really bank some, some capital, right? you could make some money, a lot of revenue there. So how can you guys help other people when you're not necessarily triggering an IPS system or triggering a, a heating system to turn on, but what are the other advantages for, for, for something in those markets? So since we, de we detect the onset of icing, it can give you an indication to stop bidding on the market because you will produce at that time, but you know that in three hours from, from now, if ice continues at the right. rate it's, it's going now, it's not, it's not a binary, we, we give a, a intensity value so we can forecast what's, what's going to happen in three hours. So you can stop bidding on the market, so you can stop, because you, you will start uh, stop uh, producing, so you will not be able to, uh, to come up with those uh, Bids. Which is a requirement at ERCOT, right? So the re regulation is happening at ERCOT right now. Is saying you have to give us some warning. We can't just have you flipping off in 15 minutes. You got to give us an advanced warning, at, at whether you're going to be on or off. Yeah, because it, it it causes the pro problem. It causes down there is cascading, cascading. brownouts, right? Where things all of a sudden like this plant goes down, this plant goes down. Well, then you all of a sudden have an unstable grid, and then this one will go down. So being able to no notify. The grid operator right. is, is it, it's a it's a major advantage for the grid operator, but so far it's been very difficult to get to them. We're, we've been work, working a lot with the operators that have the problems, but then as soon as you get larger, you have to. It's a larger organizations uh, that have different issues. Uh, well, I think they're all trying to understand the issue, and they don't realize the capability you're bringing to the marketplace right now because it's so different than what yeah. you would normally see. Yeah, one of the other advantages we talked about with an operator is the ability to know when to shut your turbines down to avoid, you know, structural uh, structural damage to your blades or that 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 uh, damage or fatigue that will build up over time when you run in ice. I've personally seen the same turbines in southern latitudes that are installed in northern latitudes and the ones in northern latitudes having much more damage internally uh, than ones in the southern latitudes. So, and that is directly equated to running them with a bunch of ice. Yeah. So the advantage there is 
that knowing when the ice is coming, because you're gonna accumulate less ice when you're not spinning. Yeah, exactly. So when the turbine is spinning, it accumulates a lot of, uh, of ice. So the idea be behind the early stopping of those turbines is to stop producing earlier on, so it will accrete less ice. And then once the event is over, because we can also tell when the, the event was over, then you can restart the turbine uh, more rapidly than if they had run through the event. And then some of it has shown that there's gain using this, this strategy. Absolutely. So, yeah, because when, sometimes you see turbines that have run in a, during an icing event and they have just massive amounts of ice on them. Then they finally shut them down because vibration alarms are going off and all right. that stuff. And then that ice sits on those turbines. It might be a week oh, yeah. that it sits on there. Now, if you had shut it down early, you wouldn't have accumulated all that ice and you'd be able to turn it back on. Exactly. And then you, while the other turbines are down for like seven days, if yeah. you were able to restart your turbines after one day, and it, that's, that yeah. means six days of produ production yeah. for one day of preemptive stoppage yeah. at, at the beginning. So, yeah. uh, it's a, it's a, it's a I would say it's a gamble, but it's a good gamble. That's a good yeah, bet. No, it, that's a good bet. Yeah. Right. Uh, especially some of these marketplaces. So the, the IceTech uh, brand name is just sort of hitting the market from Borealis side. And you guys, obviously, in TC Canada, you're out here uh, promoting the product, which is good. Uh, there's a definite marketplace, Canada, US. Nordic countries. Nordic, Nordic countries, Europe. Sweden, yeah. Norway, Finland, yep. Germany. Pick them. Uh, have you seen acceptance of the product over in Europe yet? Because it seems like an obvious fit there. Yeah, we, we've started uh, to have discussion. Obviously, for us, it's more difficult to sell over there than to sell locally. We started exporting to the U.S., which was our objective for our year two. Yeah, it's, it's a big success for us. We've been through the, the whole process of exporting to the U.S. and then. We want to go to the European market, and one big milestone that we're looking at is working with the OEM. So Ooh, being be, integrated be in their supply chain, uh, be, becoming a sensor installed, or at least offered as an option for the customer. Right. Uh, to have, and, and I strongly believe that this sensor can help the OEMs have better products. Yeah, that's fantastic. So how many units do you have out in the field right now? We have a little bit over 30 units in the, in the field. Um, we're in uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Uh, we're in Texas, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, uh, yes. Illinois, yes. Uh, Minnesota. Yes. So, so, so for listeners that are thinking about this as new technology, Ice Tech's been around. You guys, there's 15 years of research been into the product, and now it's proven. It's out in the field. It's working, yeah. and people are benefiting. Yeah, and we're. With the, we're not just selling a product, we're also providing our expertise and our services. Right. So usually with the, our, our sales cycle is pretty long, but we also, after the product is installed, we provide services for the data analysis. And sometimes it works the backwards. So we will start right. analy analyzing data from the turbine. And after that, we will recommend to install an ice sensor. So, so this service or this data analysis will lead to uh, hardware. Yeah, I, I was wondering about we, that aspect. We know that sales cycle. Oh yeah, intimately. We live that sales Strike cycle. Strike tape and light. Yeah, we're day. in the exact same thing. <laughs> Analysis, consulting, and then hey, put the strike tape on. Yeah, then we sell a thousand, right? Yeah. So, it, it, but it takes it's, the gestation time is tends to be long and wind. But it, in your case, because you have this really cool instrument and it's providing data back to you, smart people, does that then create a little bit of a development loop? Like, oh, we learned in Pennsylvania that this kind of icing happens in this sort of situation uh, that we didn't know. Yeah. Oh, there is no big surprise other than icing is always different for every site and for uh, every event and everything. Yeah. But we, um, with Daniela from right. Royalist, she had access from uh, the ice map from all over the world. So the, uh, the, these different ice maps. And what we, we took is we took the database from all the wind sites all over the, the world and merge these two databases together. So now we know where ice is and on, on what turbine. Uh, oh, really? So when customer contact us, we, we already know that they're experiencing the problem because we, we've correlated the, the, the database from the, the wind turbine site to the icing maps. <laughs> and so, and here's a, this is a side note I'm thinking, but if I was uh, looking at being a wind developer, 
and I was sighting in the northern latitudes, you guys might be someone I'd call regardless of the instrumentation, just for uh, as a process of going through my, my, my sighting reviews and things like that. What, am, what are the damages we may be looking at or what are the, the hazards we may be looking at with icing based on your knowledge? And, nice and, and the losses. Uh, yeah. Uh, and spit losses. As turbines are getting bigger, uh, the IPS are getting more mature with Borealis. Uh, yeah. uh, the OEMs have also their, their system. They're, they're getting better. So the, the losses are going down, but there's still losses caused by, by, by icing. You have to anticipate them. They're, they're going to be there. It's, it's, and it's something that uh, developers should know before they try to take a final investment decision on oh, a yeah. it. It's such a weird marketplace because you talk about operators that installed a farm five, ten years ago in the anticipated ice loss versus what actually happened. Widely yeah, different. Yeah, different. Yeah, they were told a nice song and dance story about, oh, you know, percent or two. This is the Rosemary <laughs> story, yeah. right? So Rosemary's giving me some insight on this, having been an icing person. They usually say, oh, it's a percent or two. And that 5% is the pain point, like 5% downtime, but when you want to put a, a de icing system in. But I think with the PPA prices in some of these places back, a percent or two makes a big deal. Yeah, and with, uh, you know, talking with Daniela earlier, there's some laws coming possibly down the pipeline right. in Quebec as well that will focus around uh, maintaining uptime wind assets based on ice. Right, as wind has become a couple of percentage point of the energy grid to, in Iowa, 60%, 70% of yeah. electricity is generated from wind. Icing is now a bigger deal because oh, yeah. if, you, if you cut off 70% of electricity in Iowa, there's a lot of Iowans that are going to be cold. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people are going to ride around their tractor for heat for a while. Well, absolutely. Well, you're going to fire up that wood furnace yeah. and the pellet stove. And, and we're we're based out of Quebec, so we, we focus a lot on, on that market. And there's a lot of icing. And at the moment, it's only 3%, 4% of wind penetration in, in the network. Yeah. But as this number will increase and will grow, it sure. will become a, a big issue on, on how to deal with, with icing and losing these, these big wind parks uh, one after the other. and balancing the grid. There. Right, yeah. the cascading, as Joel pointed out, the cascading effect is probably the biggest risk to the energy grid because yep. they start disconnecting and then they kick off some solar and it. Yep. And as we found out in Texas, you don't even understand how it's happening. You just know that it's happening and you don't want it to happen anymore. Yeah, here's a, and here's a question for you as well. Could, could your system, this ice type instrumentation, help out solar just knowing when they're going to ice it? It's a good question. Um, you know that icing occurs in winter months. Uh, so there's less sun also yeah, these, right. during these periods. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's it's a complicated question. But yeah. Obviously, this provides data. It's what you do with the data, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking more along the like the the unregulated market. The same idea of when when uh, you're going to be able to bid and when not to. Oh, that's because it's a trading market. Yeah. You need Not to know when to bid. Fix PPA, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, Andre, how do people find Ice Tech? Where do they go to learn about the technology? How do they get a hold of you? How do they learn about all this cool things you've built? So we have a, a web page, icetech.ca. Okay, also, it's I C E T E K. I C E T E K. Dot C A. C A. Okay. We also have a LinkedIn page where we try to update some, yeah. some material. We just posted a, a time lapse of a, an icing event just to okay. show okay. people or educate okay. people on, yeah. on the icing type that's, that's occurring and try to be present on the social, social media as well. Give us a call and drop us a line. Yeah. Okay. So uh, check out Ice Tech's webpage. Uh, Trey, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, taking some time to explain the technology. It looks really cool. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me.